Hello, 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 my darling listeners, and welcome to another episode of the Soul Sync podcast. Now, if you're watching this firstly on YouTube, you will notice uh, there's been a few differences whereby I now uh, record the intros on camera. So, normally, if you do watch them on YouTube, you'll always notice that the intros are recorded separately. But um, now they're live. You can see me. Hello, if you're watching. Hello, hello, hello. Um, how have I been? It's been a really busy week for me. Um, I have really found myself in a mode at the moment um, where I'm just wanting to research and research and research and research, particularly um, subjects involving manifestation, the law of attraction, cosmic ordering, call it as you will. But I'm trying to manifest some things into my life at the moment. One being a partner, uh, the right person, a soulmate, very interesting. I'll let you know how I get on with that. And um, I've been using this opportunity to set lots of intentions because we're coming up on the 8th of August to something called the Lion's Gate Portal, which is all t- it's, a, it's a astrological time, which is really good for letting go of things that no longer serve you, uh, letting go of uh, things in your life that you no longer uh, want or need or are good for you and about bringing uh, new things into your life and um, setting intentions and it's a great time for manifesting. I've been watching some really interesting things at the moment as well on the Gaia network which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with and I'm getting really into the work of Dr. Jo- jo- uh, Doctor, even Joe Dispenza who um, they, if you google him Um, there is a video on YouTube which talks about how to attract what you want in life and I've over the years studied the law of attraction and kind of cosmic ordering in great detail but never before have I ever come across a video that explains it so well and so simply and actually brings science and spirituality um, into uh, the picture and merges the two so it's a really good video I will put the link on the show notes for you Now, in this episode today, we're going to be talking to Debs Kiley. And Debs was born in Derbyshire in England, and she is a spirit medium and psychic. She's also um, a really well-renowned tutor. And from her earliest memories, Debs has always had an awareness of the spirit world. She was often seeing spirits and sensing their presence from a really young age. And um, she's actually a self-taught medium even. And her story is really interesting. We talk a lot about um, developing one's mediumship. Um, The conversation takes quite a few twists and turns. And I think if you're someone that's wanting to develop your intuition, um, you might be on a spiritual journey yourself or trying to deepen your connection with that of the spirit world. This is going to be a really good episode for you. So uh, without further ado, I introduce to you my conversation with Debs Kylie. So Debs, firstly, a massive, massive warm welcome onto the Soul Sync podcast. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for the invite. And of course, it's my pleasure to be here. So I've been very excited to talk to you. And um, there's, there's, I'm sure we're going to have a really action-packed hour. Obviously, in the intro, I've just told people a bit about you. But tell us a bit about your um, background and how that's influenced your journey to where you are today. Um, gosh, that's going a... straight in with it, Deb. <laughs> so I, I, first question. It's a it's a huge question. I mean, which aspect of my background do you want to hear about? You know, um... well, I guess what I want to hear about first of all is um, your experiences from your earliest memories, because um, from the notes that you gave me, you've had an awareness of the spirit world from a very young age. Tell us more about that. Yeah, I I was, um, I've always been aware of the spirit world and I always believed um, that everybody else could see the people that I could see, that they could hear them. And then obviously as I got older, maybe around the age of sort of five, six, um, I realised then of course that other people couldn't see the children that I could see or um, the people that I was aware of. And I very quickly realised it made me look weird or come across as weird to other people. Um, And then really, I want to say from the age of perhaps six, seven upwards, I didn't see them objectively anymore, which means, you know, uh, as real as I'm seeing you, it then shifted and changed. So that became a lot more rare, although it did still occur throughout my teenage years. Um, And I had many wonderful experiences with spirit growing up. And I think part of that was because 
My dad was in the military, so we moved every two years. It was just part of the job. So I was always the new kid. I was always the one that had to try and make friends somewhere or try and fit in somewhere. Um, and I know now that the spirit world drew close to play with me, to bring me up liftment, um, to just bring me at comfort, really. And I find it quite interesting that often when people sort of, you know, hear that you're a medium, what have you, they begin to tell you their creepy, spooky stories. But actually, people just fear what they don't understand. There's this misconception. I think Hollywood movies um, and things mm. like this, you know, ghost stories really can feed into that fear. But it was as I then got older and understood more about the spirit world that I realized actually um, they draw close to, to bring up Liftman and and uh, and so on. Yeah. That's it, really interesting. So you were seeing them uh, and having relation uh, ships, it sounds like. Was it the same spirit people that would come through when you was a, a child or would it be different? It was, it was always um, different people. So I remember um, my uh, dad had been deployed somewhere. And as kids, we had the opportunity to go away for this long weekend for activities for the children. And um, we stayed in this huge manor house and we'd been doing whatever activities we'd been doing all day. And then it was time to go to bed. And I was sharing the room with one other girl. Uh, and I didn't know this girl, I'd met her that weekend and the door opened and this other girl come in and she said, come on, come on, we're going to play. And so um, being a mischievous child, I, I went out into the hallway and I was, there was loads of other children in the hallway and we were all running up and down and laughing. And we went to another floor of the building and I became aware that one by one, the kids started disappearing. And I, I, I remember it so vividly having the thought, well, where are the other children going? Because I didn't see them leave. And then eventually this member of staff approached and there was a boy standing behind me. I remember him so clearly with his striped T-shirt. And the member of staff spoke directly uh, to me and she scolded me, get back in your room. You can't be running around in the halls. And I remember thinking that's profoundly unfair. And I toddled back to my room. And just before I got to the room, the boy was with me. And just as I got to the room, the boy had gone. And wow. it was only as an adult that I realised they were spirit children because they were so real to me, you see. Um, I think what tickles me is that if there'd been CCTV, you know, people wouldn't have seen on the camera all these other children that I could see. <laughs> You've just seen me running up and down laughing. <laughs> what did your um, parents um, say about all this at the time then? What was their reaction to um, yeah. you and the spirit world? My parents were certainly not spiritualists. They were just mum and dad. I was very lucky in that my parents always believed me. They never said to me, don't be silly. They never said a load of nonsense. Um, I remember being 14 and I remember laying in bed and hearing a man speak to me um, very, very clearly. And I was um, petrified and I went down and told my dad, you know, I can hear this voice in my room uh, and he's talking to me. Um, and my dad came up to the room and sat down next to the bed and there was nothing, not a peep. And then my dad left and the talk in the chatter began again. I couldn't see him, but I could hear him so clearly. Um, but they always believed me. So I was lucky. I know that's not always the case with a lot of people. So you had these experiences. Then you mentioned that kind of as you got into your teenage years, did they kind of follow you through? Or how did it kind of uh, sort of develop and unfold for you as uh, as you went into those kind of that confusing time of being a teenager? Um... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it's my belief that the spirit world comes knocking at our door, so to speak, to invite us to work alongside them. And we have free will whether we want to um, work alongside the spirit world. So I had these episodes um, very, very frequently throughout the whole of my life. And so therefore they were saying there's, you know, there's another world here. There are people here. We're knocking at your door. We have to get your attention somehow. And that's exactly um, what happened, you know. So it wasn't like at 14 or at 10. It was consistent all the way through. It's just how I perceived them changed from being able to see them very objectively and very real 
um, to perhaps only hearing them. And there was only a few occasions thereafter where I could see spirit objectively as I'm seeing you, you now, you know, but that's what they did. They came knocking at the door to get my attention. You are a medium, you know, uh, like, use uh, with uh, me, uh, uh, please. Uh, you know, see what we can do together. Why did you stop seeing them? Is there no kind of reason or logic or was that meant to be the case? Was that there to perhaps help you with your mediumship? Because it sounded like it was all coming to you too easily in the younger years. It's very common. And it's my personal belief that we, we know if we look at psychology and the developmental stages of a child, when a child is very, very young, typically up to the age of six, not exclusively, but typically, a child is going through the world and learning about the world with their subconscious mind at the forefront, their instincts, and they soak up everything like a sponge. Mm -hmm. And then around the age of six, what happens is their logical, analytical part of the mind begins to develop. So what that means to us is that they begin to question things, they begin to take on the views of people around them a lot more. Um, they might become more critical thinkers. So that that aspect of the mediumship that can be so natural in the beginning mm. to change uh, and move in a different way. And that's, you know, if we think of children who had that invisible friend and they get to a certain age, that invisible friend is gone. So we can think of spirit people. It's mm. just developmental stages of the mind um, and sociological factors that can then change that. I hope that's made sense. <laughs> no, it definitely does. It definitely does. So what age did you start doing readings for other people? Um, when did you start using your um, mediumship in, in that regard? Yeah, my late 20s. I'm uh, in my 40s now, but in my, in my late 20s, but only sort of um, having a play with cards, nothing serious. And then what happened further along is that um, I'd gone to this lady for a tarot reading, uh, this fellow uh, British woman living abroad, and I'd heard she was fabulous, and she was fabulous. And she ran a group where people could go and learn to meditate and learn to do tarot. Mm. The Debs, you really ought to come along. You know, you've got the gift. And <laughs> I thought, mm. um, And I decided to go along because I, I wanted to learn to be in control of what was taking place. Um, I wanted to learn, believe it or not, to switch it off. Oh. To not, you know, uh, to be more in control and switch it off. And what I found was when I when I went there, I learned to do, learned to read tarot properly. And then what happened is I would offer tarot readings at home and someone from the spirit world would join me and I would literally just describe what I'd been told, what I heard, what I saw or what I knew. And that's how... That then began that I started offering um, evidential mediumship readings. It was a very natural progression where I literally just described what I, what I was told. You know, it was an evolution in that way. It's interesting. So you started doing that. What, why was you trying to shut it out? Was it, it was sort of, it sounds like it was a bit out of control. What, 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 <laughs> what was going on for you to want to shut it down? Because I didn't understand what was taking place. Oh, okay. If I was standing, <laughs> there were times where um, I didn't want to hear a voice talking to me uh, because we fear what we don't understand. That's all it was. Mm. And I didn't understand it, um, you know. And so I wanted to learn to be in control. I wanted to learn to be able to switch it off at the appropriate times and to be able to switch it on at will, if that was even possible, was my thought, you know. And so I thought, why not go along with an open mind and, and just see if this lady can help me? But she didn't really um, instruct or teach mediumship. What she taught was very much the psychic faculty. But I'm very grateful to her because off the back of that, um, my mediumship the, really then opened up um, and then the journey began of learning how to switch it on and switch it off, so to speak. Yeah. So that's interesting. Obviously, you've had, like we all do, challenges along the way. But is there kind of, um, do you have memories of challenges, obstacles that have tested your faith or belief in the spirit world over a period of time? No. No. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Absolutely not. What I would say is, for me personally, I can only, you know, speak from my own experiences. Yes. As, as a spiritualist, it's my belief system. And 
I was born into a family where they were of a different religious belief, not my parents, but my um, grandparents. And so for me, I think the challenge was uh, when it came to my faith is looking at, well, what do I believe? What is my belief system? Um, who is this um, divine spirit everybody's talking about? And over time, learning to or discovering my relationship to God, if you will, or the great spirit, uh, you know, um, however you want to put it. That for me was um, a real journey in moving away from these indoctr indoctrinated thoughts to which never sat right with me personally anyway, to, well, what do I believe? What does sit right for me? Um, mm. That was a real quest, real inner journey, you know. So uh, I, I want to kind of delve uh, into your kind of mediumship in more detail, because a lot of, um, I'm not going to say aspiring mediums, but a lot of people who are trying to develop do listen to um, this podcast. Um I want to go into kind of the interconnectedness or unity in the world around you. And how does that um, sort of influence your mediumship, um, the interconnectedness of the world? How do you sort of see that this is all fixed together, if that's the right question, if that makes sense? If, if, I, if I've understood you correctly, Jason, do you mean when working with a spirit communicator, um, how yeah, does that yeah. Yeah, ending and that bond with them. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, the spirit... I've asked that in a really backwards way, but yes, thank you for inter <laughs> thank you for interpreting it in that way. I, I, just, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I just um the spirit world's all around us. You know, I think maybe there can be this idea sometimes that the spirit world is far away and they're hard to reach, but actually, we are a world within a world. The spirit world, we are already. Um, within the spirit world and then the spirit world's already all around us um so for me it's the idea of reaching my mind out to them my mm. mind simply goes to them and that's where I would hold the concentration it's not this feeling of I wait for them to come to me and you know be, and this feeling of oh they're far away they're not they're very very close and my mind goes to them and that's where we listen you know so when you, because I, I, I'll go straight in with some of the challenges that I encounter, um, because I'm sure they're very similar to some of the challenges that other people listening to this encounter. Um, my, my problem is, is a lot of the time I don't feel that I could even feel spirit around me. But um, I, I, and I'm still on this um, bloody battle of being able to try and get myself into the right zone. So let, let's I, I want to unpack some of your advice, because obviously you go all around the world teaching people. Um, let, let's start from someone wants to feel spirit around them. Um, how, what, what would you say is the first steps of getting to, to, to that point? I think the first thing is, is to sit in the still. Um, what I find is that people often want to rush their development. Mm-hmm. How can I get names? Names is just another piece of evidence. You know, how can I get this? How can I get that? To almost want to rush through it. And the development of mediumship cannot be rushed. It's just the nature of it. To have the patience and to sit in the stillness and to first become aware of our own energy, to feel what does my aura feel like? What does my natural energy and my power feel like? Who am I? Mm. and then mm. to distinguish the difference of becoming aware of the power the energy the frequency if you will of the spirit world around us and then to practice perhaps with you know volunteers in the spirit world draw close let me feel your presence what does that feel like there are things that can't be rushed if we're really wanting to feel the spirit world you know not just listen to them but really feel that closeness with them when students are coming to you, what what are the biggest, um, you know, challenges people tend to face or preconceptions people have? Because I'm, I, I always think mediumship is a, a very, very, very hard thing to teach because it's, in my experience, it's so personal. It's very different for everyone, and you're trying to teach something that really you're you're using a lot of analogies and it's it, to me. It, 
I understand when you actually strip it back, it's very simple. Sit in the stillness. That is so simple, but it's not simple. It's really hard because of the human ego system that we have that just seems to get in the way of um, so much. What do you find? What What's your experiences of, you know, teaching this? I think it's in, imperative that um, when working with somebody that we do look at them as an individual, what will work for one person won't work for another. And it's looking at what do they need in their toolbox to help them. Often I find the biggest challenges is not the spirit world um, in how they're perhaps working with the medium, but it's the medium trusting what they're getting is that the top of the bill is how do I trust? How do I know? I think the other thing is, which you said, Jason, you know, this being in the still and it's very, very difficult. And that's um, another challenge for everybody is to learn to hold that concentration, to hold it there with the spirit communicator. And that's practice because we're asking our brains to do something that it might not be used to doing. I have in my everyday life, I have a butterfly mind and I have to write everything down as I'll forget it within five minutes. Oh, I'm exactly the same. <laughs> yes. I'm a big, big um, note taker and, you know, um, working off lists and things, but it's just, uh, it's just practice, 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 holding that concentration with them. That's the thing I find that um, a lot of students work on and also understanding that evidence isn't random this idea to fire off one piece of evidence and another piece of evidence and another piece of evidence when in actual fact this the people in spirit have come to talk to loved ones here I I yeah. to it as a conversation that's my thing where one is the talker which is the person in spirit and the person here is the listener and that's mm. the job of the medium, truly, to let two people that love each other have that conversation. It's not about the medium. And, and no, the it's not. But it quite often it seems to be. It seems to become about the medium, doesn't it? Um, I, I, I guess you know we can sort of talk. I want to come back to the the medium's toolbox. I want to know what else is in the toolbox. Um, but before we, <laughs> we got. Uh, 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 well, we, well, well, we, we're not limited to any time. Really, how long can you keep going for, Debs? Really, it's more a test of your stamina um, than anything else. So you were just, where, where, what was you just saying? I've just lost my trailer of thought, um, being silly, making jokes. Yeah, you were but... saying, uh, sorry, go on. What was you just, just uh, reverse back a bit because yeah, I had a no, question we're... off the back of it and now I've lost my trailer thought. This happens a lot on the Soul Sync, don't worry. This, this is a regular occurrence. I can relate, Jason. Honestly, I can relate. <laughs> and we were talking about that. I like the idea personally. It's just my thing of that it's a conversation. Oh, the yes. The person in spirit is the talker. The person here is the listener. Not that that's misunderstood. It doesn't become a conversation with the medium. That's not what I mean. But these are still people. These are you and I when we're dead. I mean, to yes. talk to family and best friends. Yeah. But we need the evidence. We need to prove mm. survival. We need to prove that people retain their personality, that they can evolve in spirit, um, that the spirit world can evoke um, people's faith, power, understanding that actually we as people on earth are not just skin and bone. We are so much more than that. That's what mediumship mm -hmm can do you know um but essentially um for me it's about being the voice for the person in spirit that's wanting to have a conversation mm. with a loved one or or their best mate you know the, 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 i yeah you were you, what you were saying about serving spirit i think that i i've come across i think a lot of mediums because i think they get a lot of mediums get people looking up to them almost like god that you've got this kind of belief system yeah you've got this gift but you're the only person that can uh, communicate with the other side and i've i've noticed as well that you know some mediums it, it it becomes less about the spirit person and more about them um and i think sometimes it's you know mediumship isn't always um you know perhaps practiced it in the right way to, to go back to the toolbox then because i think that was a great analogy um what should a medium's toolbox look like or what should it contain or is there any guidance you can give us in that regard i think to do this vocation um 
I think it's first of the understanding that it is a vocation. It's not a change of career. You know, mm-hmm. it's not one day I wake up and I want to I want to do this, you know, full time. It's I think firstly looking at it with the reverence it deserves and the understanding of um what it is that we're doing is so precious. I think that will help the individual go a very, very long way. I think patience. I have mm-hmm. listen, this is the the um pop uh, pop calling the kettle black. I never used to I, I've learned to be more patient, but but patience and kindness to self when developing to not always criticize self, but to think, okay, what went well there? What would I do differently next time? And why? And to understand that development is ongoing for those that want to, to, to want to push themselves further. Um, trust. Mm. Trust the spirit world and to trust ourselves. And if something's incorrect, then it's incorrect. It's not the end of the world. Um, that mediumship can be experimental we can't compare ourselves to other people we're unique how this mm. world works with us is unique and and how we work is always going to be unique because we're individuals yeah you know but that said going back to what you said a moment um ago jason is i think as mediums we're not a collect- we're not a unique group because again it's a personal belief of mine I believe the spirit world, uh, people in the spirit world work with many people here on earth. They may not be aware of it. So if you think of carers, doctors, nurses, maybe foster parents, uh, people that work to help other people in some way, Mm. that thought pops in their mind, who's to say it isn't from the spirit world an inspiration to help them? Mm. I don't think we're a unique club, you know. I think there are many, many people that are possibly working along the spot side the spirit world. They wouldn't call themselves a medium, perhaps they wouldn't even know, but you know, the, the spirit was able to influence their mind in some way. Yeah, I've only just started to realize, I think, even myself, that uh, um I've been using psychic skills for a very, very, very long time without realising I was using them. I, well, I built a multi-million pound rec- recruitment agency through being able to read people. And then it only came as a surprise to me. And I thought, how have I done this? And I thought, well, it's because you can just sense things. I thought, And then I, then I thought to myself, well, I, I'm a psychic. I've been doing this for years just without even realising it. Um, when I, I guess I want to, because there's a lot of, I get a lot of questions from people about the spirit world and, and, I just want to ask some questions about, so when, when we pass over, we go to the spirit world. Um, but then obviously we will have a reincarnation at some point. I think they're personal beliefs. That's what, oh, you... love. That's what I love about spiritualism. There is no, no, there are no rules or creed. Everyone can make up their own mind about that. So I have friends that absolutely believe in reincarnation. And then I have friends that say, absolutely not. You know? What do you believe in? I, I used to believe in reincarnation. And then I didn't. <laughs> and at the moment, I'm back on the fence again. What I don't believe... Uh, it's just my personal belief. I don't believe that we go to the spirit world and we would reincarnate immediately. That doesn't sit right with me personally. It's just mm. something. Because can you imagine then you and I, Jason, we go to the spirit world, we're looking forward to seeing our parents. No, sorry, you know, they're reincarnated. Um, you're gonna have to wait, you know, another 80, 90 years. Perhaps. That would be a bit of an that anti-climax. Was, was yeah, exactly. You know, you've got that world <laughs> community. You, you go to the spirit world. And um, I haven't received anything personally from the spirit world that tells me there is such a thing as reincarnation. Not yet. I'm on the fence. I'm open-minded. Mm. I, 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 yeah, I, I think my belief is similar. I, I do believe in reincarnation, but I don't like you i I don't think it's an instant thing i i (laughs) this is where we start getting really deep into beliefs i think that you have to stay up there a few generations is my belief before you are given the opportunity to reincarnate but you know we won't go down that rabbit hole um obviously you've had a lot of moments throughout your um kind of career as such 
Um, but can you tell us about any perhaps profound moments of awe or wonder that you've had um, in regards to something sacred or divine? Any experiences which really made you go, oh, you know? Oh, um, there's quite a few come into mind, but the first one uh, that came back to my memory was uh, I'm also a physical medium. Mm -hmm. And um, I would sit, um, I had a circle and we would sit weekly it's when I was living in Cambridgeshire. And we would sit in the dark and with the red light. And But that's not what I wanted. I didn't want to have to sit with the theatre of the red light and in the dark. Um, and we were very lucky in that we had phenomena from the off. Um, and what happened was we were having um, tea and biscuits afterwards. And um, I said to, the, said to the two guys that would sit for me weekly, I said, you know, I said, if we can't do this in the light, I really don't want, I wouldn't want to do this. And as I said that, they said, oh, my goodness, um, there was absolute transfiguration on my face of an old man with a big beard, big gray beard. Um, this is with the lights on, in the light as you're seeing it now. And I got up and I walked across to the mirror and I saw it myself. And it was very much a personal experience, but I was just in utter shock. I wasn't looking at myself. It was completely looking at the face of an old man and not just a little bit, like full on. And that was really like, wow, the physical mediumship can be done in the light. And it was just, that was one of those moments that took my breath away. Wow. Um, I bet it did, looking yeah, in the mirror and yeah, looking back really, at you wasn't that. That was really <laughs> profound. Yeah, that was, that was profound experience um another time when um i was uh, married to my ex-husband and his mum and his stepdad uh, were in the back and we were in the south of germany driving through um the mountains if you will not mountains but you know we're coming down this massive steep hill and it had hairpin bends with huge pine trees um and it was a lovely sunny day and as i was driving down i was driving i could see a man staring at me through the pine trees and I said to everybody in the car, can you see him as well? And they said, yes. <laughs> We're in the middle of nowhere. And this guy's just standing there staring at me. And as we came around this hairpin bend, all of a sudden I had no brakes on the car. And what I mean was, it's not like in the movies where the pedal was going up and down. It was like pushing against lead. And luckily I was only sort of in second gear. And I said to my ex husband, oh my God, you know, I've got no brakes, I've got no brakes. And I just went down to first gear. And then I just literally very, very slowly went down this um, small mountain. Um, and we were very lucky to, as we came down at the bottom, there was a garage and the guy had a look and what had happened is something to do with the brakes, the clip had come undone. And that's why I didn't have any brakes. But that man there that we all saw in the middle of nowhere, sort of saying slow down be careful here that stayed with me how beautiful is that my goodness so, i love these stories yeah, it's amazing <laughs> it's wonderful um, so moving on then to um like i said earlier there's lots of um mediums and developing mediums who listen to this so i want to try and get into this next part with you advice and Holes of wisdom are things that you have learned over the years about your <laughs> mediumship that you can share with all of the lovely listeners here because I think that, you know, you've got so much experience and wisdom and we want to try and unpack some of that, Debs. Where do I begin? I have different tutors. Mm -hmm. Have different tutors. You'll take bits and pieces from everybody. Experiment with it, make your own mind up. I always refer to it as a buffet. So if you imagine you're going up to a buffet with your plate, if you like what's being taught, you know, pop it on your plate. If it doesn't sit right with you, um, it's okay to leave it. Mm -hmm. It's to find out what's working for us because what will work for one person might not work for another person, but at least give it a go, you know, at least try it. Um, Again, it goes back to the biggest thing is just trust the journey. I know I keep coming back to this, but trust the journey. Trust that spirit has a plan for you. The other thing I would say is be open-minded. So someone might think, oh, do you know, I'd, I'd love to be an evidential medium and give one-to-one -one readings. Maybe that's my thing. But maybe they would be an, a phenomenal healer. Mm. 
or a great trance healer or a phenomenal, you know, spirit artist to be open minded and try different things throughout this this journey. Mm. To also remember there is no end goal. You know, it's not yeah. like patient, it's like, yay, nailed it. You know, it's not <laughs> like it's ongoing. It's ongoing. <clears throat> to understand it's an ongoing journey. Yeah. It is. And I th- I think when I, you know, even I fell down this trap when I first um managed to get well the, the first, uh, people have heard this story before but when i the first time i went to the arthur finley college i only went there with wanting to know one thing but the spirit world is real yeah. and to say they gave me a carrot honestly it was just like flicking a switch on it just kept coming to me easy as anything Ooh. so then i um left the college didn't really want to know what didn't really know what to do with this and then couldn't i couldn't replicate it ever again um <laughs> but it's that um, you know, I thought I thought it was easy. I thought it was easy, easy to just go, God, you know, I'm getting readings, no problem. But it is, you know, you have to go away and uh really develop. And I think my my journey, I, I at times um I will have moments of okay, yes, the spirit was absolutely real, I could feel it, da, da, da. and then I'll have moments of going, Am I just making all of this up? You know, <laughs> is it because uh, and I'm still going through this process um of going well, why can't I feel them now? Where are they? Um, but you know, it's it's a funny old journey, and um, but I keep finding myself drawn back to it again, and I just can't, um, you know, you, you know when you get that feeling, I'm just being pulled back to it all the time because that's, it's that's on a, that's on a it's annoying me. It's it <laughs> is actually annoying me um, because <laughs> I am like that when I try to do something and I just can't seem to master it i'm very stubborn and i the hardest thing for me has been meditation um you know at the very start when i started it i was sitting on a cushion trying to sit upright going no nothing's happening mm. um and it's taken me a long time to work out actually having an adhd brain just how to actually meditate properly that in I, itself has been hard i understand um, i've got adhd too oh, and tell us understand you. <laughs> how do you um how do you um Medicine. What's what's your technique? If- I used, I used to really really struggle to sit in power, um, and what I used to do going back to when I was um, learning to sit in the power, which I thought back then was meditation. I didn't know there was a difference back then. You know, I, like I said, I didn't have a tutor or a teacher or anything. I used to set a timer. It was such a struggle for me. And I think people can go for a walk and and feel the closeness of spirit. People can do gardening and feel the closeness of spirit. And we don't have to sit necessarily with our eyes closed. If someone can do that and achieve that, great. So what the way I personally feel about it, I'm about um, quality over quantity. So Mm. I'm going to sit with them for five minutes. Why does it have to be an hour? Yeah. I couldn't manage an hour, you know, I yeah. struggle with 20 minutes um, and it, what recently I've come to realize that apparently there is 111 techniques to meditate and people with ADHD, um, what you have, this is my understanding, but you have to, what we're trying to do is to tell our brain, Shh, be quiet, just quiet. Down. Actually, that's apparently that's the wrong thing to do. Um, I you the the right thing to do is to actually so this is what I do now. I will go into like a coffee shop or sit by my um in my room where I do my meditation, and I will listen um intently to every single sound. So every car that goes by, and I try to listen to like three different sounds in a second, mm-hmm. and then after about three minutes, I'm exhausted with it. Then yeah. I just say, right now, I'm going to be quiet and do my meditation then because i've exhausted my mind my only two options i give my mind is listen to every sound and pay attention to everything or meditate and after three minutes of doing that i'm exhausted and we then i can go into it we can't ask our brains to go blank it, it's no. not it's a computer that's constantly you know if you compare it to a computer that's constantly running is to give it a focal point so to to give it something to concentrate on. For some people, it might be thinking of a candle. That didn't work for me. I tried all that. What worked for me was focusing on energy just outside of the body or around the face. 
but to feel it and keep my concentration there. What do I feel? To give the mind something to do. And then if the mind drifts off, which it's going to do, it's okay. Just bring it back again. To give I it... suppose by paying attention to the energy around you, that in itself is putting you in the right um, zone to feel the spirit people, I guess. That's absolutely right. Yep. That's where you're beginning to learn to feel energy, sense energy. What do I feel? What am I aware of? Mm. Is, is there a particular... Um, mentor or um person that's kind of inspired your journey um over the years in your development yeah so um when I, again when i was living in in germany i didn't really know you know um you could do courses on this and things like this by now i'd heard about the arthur finley college i had heard there's somewhere people can go um and um i'd signed up for this mentorship scheme this two-year mentorship scheme knowing we were moving back to uk um, moved back to UK and I think something like eight months later this mentorship scheme began and that was with uh, Minister Simone Key and I remember on the first day sitting there and I found out that it was for accreditations I didn't know you could do accreditations I didn't know and it was a bit like you know what, what are you doing here and I'm like oh I don't know you see the spirit was sneaky because if I if I'd have known it was for accreditations I wouldn't have gone somehow didn't register that anywhere uh in my mind you know um but um yeah i must say i learned so much from simone particularly you know for the philosophy and the public speaking aspect of it and so on um yes very grateful is there any kind of um books that you've read over the years or um podcasts or any uh recommendations things that have shaped your journey or you've read them and gone my goodness that was a good read I think for beginners, um, is it Gordon, uh, Gordon, Gordon Smith? I don't know if I quoted that correctly. You know, the psychic barber. Mm -hmm. um, that There's some really good exercises in that book. I think if people are wanting to understand um, spiritualism or the spirit world better when they're looking to philosophy to get a, a, perhaps a bigger understanding of it, any of the Silver Birch books, Oh, I keep seeing those, brilliant. but yeah, yeah, I, I, I do. Every time I, I go to the college, I see all those silver birch books, but I've, I, I keep looking at them, but I've never uh, actually picked one up. But I keep thinking, what are they? I, I don't really know what silver birch is. Um, yes, yeah. so silver birch was, um, it was actually many minds in the spirit world that spoke through, um, this spirit body, if you will. And um, through the medium who was called Maurice Barbonell. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's fantastic. I mean, Maurice Barbon Barbonell was a journalist for one of the top UK newspapers at the time. And he'd gone to investigate this so-called spiritualism, was a non-believer, didn't have any um, you know belief uh, in anything, went along. And then one day he fell asleep. And when he woke up, he apologized to the group. I'm so sorry, I, I fell asleep. And unbeknown to him, the spirit world had spoken through him uh, it, with trance speaking, trance control speaking. And that's where that began. And when asked, when the, when the circle had asked, well, what's your name? Um, the voice said, does it matter? And there was a silver birch tree outside. And, and the voice said, just call me silver birch. But Silver Birch was actually great minds in the spirit world coming together, speaking through the medium of Maurice Barbonell. And it was, um, yeah, I, I've um, really enjoyed those books. I really have. And you can dive oh. into them time and time again. It's fascinating, fascinating read. I'll make sure I go and have a look at those. Um, I, I, they jumped out at me, but as you can probably see, I've got an, enough books. I've got books after books after, and I've actually now, uh, made a rule on myself I'm not buying any more books until <laughs> I have read a large amount of the ones I've already got um, because I'm running out of storage um, room for them um what what do you think the future of kind of mediumship spirituality is looking like in the world we live in now then what what do you think is what do you do you think we're waking up more to this or do you think we're becoming much further yeah. disengaged from the world around us I think both. Um, I know that's a bit uh, contradictory, but I think both. I think on one hand, we're living in a world where materialism seems to be outweighing 
spirituality, if you will. So irregardless of what belief that person holds and so on, we seem to be bombarded with it, whether we're on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, any form of social media, uh, materialism, 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 you know, um, look like this, live like this, eat like this, do this. And um, for me, I believe spiritualism for, for me is the counterbalance to materialism. It's that part of us that is the soul and the spirit. Um, I think with the internet, you know, the birth of the internet, it's been a fantastic tool, but I think also it's really fed that machine of consumerism even more and materialism. So there's mm -hmm. there's that coupled with the mental health crisis, you know, that everybody seems to, you know, all, many countries are going through at the moment. Um, on the other hand, because of this, the other side of that coin is people are stopping and saying, hang on a minute, life's too fast. You know, it's become quite trendy to go away and ha go on a retreat somewhere, you know, uh, to go away on some meditative uh, retreat for a week. People are looking for that solace. People are looking for something outside of the rat race and um, the busy world we're living in. Mm. It is kind of catch catch 22. Um, it is. There's, there's pros and there's cons, but I, I, I guess to the internet. But I think that... I think people are becoming aware that, you know, the world we're living in now is not necessarily a healthy one. And you have to have quite strict boundaries with yourself because even I find myself guilty of it. I, I think to myself, Jason, get off your bloody mobile phone. You're glued to it, man. What are you doing? Um, so even I'm, you know, very aware of it. And actually, um, you know, I, I do think that I think I think more and more people are going to start waking up more spiritually because I think we're, we're getting to a point, I think, where I think there's going to be a catalyst. A lot of people are starting to go, hang on a minute. The, the, this world, the way we're communicating with each other and stuff, it just it isn't fulfilling me. Um, I think I actually think that's why there is such a mental health crisis. Um, I think funding is one issue. But I think yeah. another big issue is pe people are just, you know, wondering what what, what yeah. the hell is this world all about? What what Where are we going? Uh, yeah. What are we doing? Um, so, yes, well... Debs, I would like to, I always ask guests this, um, and I do have a habit of putting people on the spot, but I always ask guests for a final kind of anecdote, a bit of wisdom, a final thought, or something that you can leave us on today. Don't compare yourself to others. You can't compare yourself to others. You were never meant to be like other people. You was always meant to be you. That includes your mediumship, that includes your personal beliefs, that includes where you think you might want to go. Be open-minded and curious about where this journey is going to take you both in life and when looking at spirituality or spiritualism. Try and trust the process. If you feel you got it wrong, give yourself a break. You was never meant to be perfect. We're all just here learning and fumbling our way through. Um, enjoy the process. Try and enjoy the process, which means look at it. What can I learn from this? What would I do differently next time? And please don't forget to ask yourself, and what went well and what did I do right? Yes, I do think I think that's a really good point. I've been terrible at times um, comparing myself to other people in their mediumship development. And that person knows their guy, but I don't know my dad and this person's done this and I can't do that. And you just get lost in it. And sometimes yeah. I am, you know, even myself, I can relate to that because I find myself going down rabbit holes where I'll, I'll definitely focus on the things that I'm not doing so well rather than the things I do do. I actually made this rule with myself and I said, because I give myself a hard time a lot, um, and I said to myself recently, right, Jason, if you talk to yourself, uh, if you was to talk to friends the way you talk to yourself, you would have no friends. So now I have to talk to myself the way I would talk to my friends. And that's kind of the way I try and, um, you know, because uh, uh, sometimes we just do silly things, don't we? I used to say to myself, Jason, you idiot. You've done this once again. And I think, why would you know, why am I talking to myself in this way of with a lack of self-compassion? You see, we're part um, of the team. We're part mm. of the team. Um, Matthew Smith, Minister Matthew Smith, once said um, to me that when we're really hard on ourselves, we seem to be forgetting 
about the people in spirit. I wonder what it might make them feel like. That was a light bulb moment for me. And I thought, wow, that's a game changer. Because if I'm thinking to myself, well, that was no good. That was rubbish. Well, hang on a minute. They were working there, trying their best as well. And so what can I learn from this and what went well moving forward? Yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much, Debs, for coming on to the Soul Sync podcast. It's been a really lovely conversation and it's been so good to have you here. So thank you. Thank you, Jason. I've enjoyed it. Thanks. If you do want to find out more about Debs, just 